without further ado, let's get started. So I'm going to invite Dr. Ann Zink, medical officer for the new Department of Health, up here to join me and uh, welcome. <laughs> and let's see, let's see if we can find one of these. How's that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Good, good. <laughs> good, good. Very good. So, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us again. I just saw you on the screen there. You participated as a speaker in the past, so we're so excited to have you back. So, um, we could start at many places in this kind of conversation, but you've played a really big role over the last few years as we've gone through this pandemic. It's been kind of a roller coaster of a time. So kind of tell us how you came to this role, what your background is, and a little bit about what you're doing now. Great, thanks Vern, and thanks. it's really great to see so many friends and uh, what feels sometimes like my work family uh, in this room uh, and Alaskans. You know, I came to Alaska uh, as actually a mountaineering guide, fell in love with the place and a person, uh, and thought that I would come up here for two to three years after residency working in the emergency department. And I quickly saw that working in the emergency department is where you saw all public policy come to fail. And the complex patient who saw you every single day uh, and had as many x-rays as would crash the system if he came in, also had a face and a name and a story and a history of depression and, was flail and the system was failing him to get connected. You saw the opioid crisis take, again, a name and a face and when someone's child, someone's loved one, someone who's really struggling with addiction. And you saw how people were coming into the emergency department terrified to be admitted because of cost of care, that they were gonna go bankrupt if they couldn't afford uh, the cath lab for their heart attack, what that was gonna look like. And I quickly realized that if I was gonna care for my patients, I had to care for the larger system of healthcare. I just couldn't care for that one patient, I had to care for the larger health system. So I started to ask too many questions and go to too many meetings uh, and uh, met many of you all in that, in that journey, uh, in that process, um, and got to know my predecessor, Dr. Jay Butler, um, and had told him when I grew up I wanted to be like him. I said, you know, he was kind to the people but hard on the policy issues, uh, and kind of said it more theoretically uh, until Commissioner Crum uh, called in January of 2019, and I was honored to step into this role in July of 2019. Um, in the space and thought that I was coming in here to think about complex patient care, thinking about behavioral health, thinking about the ways that we make our systems uh, better for patients. Uh, and uh, then COVID happened. Uh, and then there was that. Um, I really never thought that I, you know, I'm not an infectious disease specialist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I sometimes joke that I played one on TV, but um, I'm not the chief medical officer of COVID. I'm the chief medical officer of the state of Alaska. And during this time, we continue to fight the epidemic of opioids. We continue to address chronic health conditions. We continue to, we identified our own orthopox virus, Alaska pox during that time, and continue to do a lot of the work that happens. Um, and it's great to now be at a different place where we're able to think more broadly about the system. In public health, we oftentimes talk about this proverb of pulling people out of the river, that you're at the the bank and, and in healthcare we're pulling people out of the river all the time and someone kind of looks up from that and says like, well why are people pulling, falling into the river and moves upstream and realizes that the bridge collapsed or the houses are being blown in or the bank failed. And I feel like my career has been similar to that. I um, literally have been like pulling people out of the, you know, emergent river in the emergency department and realized that I needed to go upstream. But I love also being able to go in the emergency department and see what's working and what's not working and continue to find that space. Yeah, I love that uh, analogy or metaphor about that going upstream. It, it just kind of brings the whole conversation of social determinants of health into the conversation because health which is really what we're trying to get to, not just health care, but health, it depends on so many, so many things. Um, uh, maybe we can talk about that, in, or maybe you have something to add to that. Uh, I could go down that one for a long time. I mean, yeah, I mean, 5% <laughs> of our patients are about 50% of the cost. 80% yeah. um, of our health is determined by modifiable factors, such as diet, exercise, smoking, connection, things like transportation. You know, for every dollar that we spend on healthcare, we spend between one to 10 cents on prevention, one dollar on primary care, and the rest on subspecialty care. And if you look at the United States and Alaska as a whole, we spend more per capita, yet we get less. And so if we are going to really not have healthcare usurp the entire budget of small businesses, of our state, of our economy, 
and we're going to have people more healthy and well, we need to think collectively how we move upstream to be able to make people more healthy and well. The cheapest patients are healthy patients, and so collectively we need to move that direction. Yeah, yeah. So um, we do need to talk about the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> So you were thrust into this uh, role unexpectedly uh, six months after you uh, became the, uh, came to the department. Um, the biggest public health emergency or challenge in a century since the Spanish flu pandemic. So uh, the folks in 1918 didn't have much to go on either, but they learned from previous ones previous pandemics. In this, in this case, y there you were. What, what, what have we learned from that? Um, and what do we see going forward? Yeah, sometimes I felt like it was being strapped to the front of a rocket ship. And I think some people in this room could relate to exactly what that uh, was like. And we were like, wait, is this really happening today? Is that what's going to happen next? Um, and again, it was a, a real honor to serve in that space, but more than anything, it was an honor to serve with Alaskans who came together. I think I really took away three major things, that it was about partnerships, it was about priorities, and it was about perspective. And so to kind of go through that, you know, thinking about partnerships, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were stepping on each other's toes. You know, the tribal system and us both sent testing machines to the same place. Um, we were, you know, thinking that the federal government was going to send resources or that we were going to be able to partner, but it became clear that testing would be allocated based on the total number of your cases, not even cases per capita. Like we would have to have everyone in the state of Alaska before we could get like a nasal swab. Um, we were going through drawers to actually see if we could find any more of those. And so we really realized that we were on our own and we needed to figure out how we were going to respond to that space together. And I think that that transition and that shift to, okay, who are our partners here? How can we work together? Uh, was a truly Alaska experience and we saw Alaskans stand up. You know, we had people 3D manufacturing swabs that we then tested in public health nurses' noses and our state lab was able to do control to be able to make sure that was okay and then submit that to the FDA and get approval all within about a week. We were able to send up our testing site within the state of Alaska, you know, and through that process, you know, we were the most tested state per capita for almost a year and a half with no commercial lab, no ability to be able to rely on the outside sector. Um, we saw that with vaccines. You know, I oftentimes would say that we were just the Amazon delivery service for vaccines, but it was really our tribal partners, our local municipalities, our local clinics that did all of the amazing work. I loved looking at social media during that time because I would see how they, they took that last final mile and made it happen. That wasn't on us, it wasn't us doing this, it was us facilitating local leaders to be able to do what made sense in their community. You know, we were the only state where every tribe partnered with the state to be able to get vaccine out. And that partnership allowed us to be more effective in getting it out, more efficient in getting it out, um, and what helped us to lead the country for months as the most vaccinated state in the country per capita. And I think that because of those things, by testing early and being able to identify, by being able to empower communities to do the work that they needed to do, getting vaccine out early, if you look at our death rate compared to our peer states, or if you look compared to the nation, we have about, as, about half as many deaths as our peer states per capita. And there's many ways to look at this pandemic and it's been hard and it's been challenging and each one of those lives is a tragic life lost. Um, but I am grateful for the lives that are saved, and I think that those partnerships made a huge difference uh, in that space. The second is priorities. Um, the public health infrastructure has been slowly decimated over time. You know, we put National Guard in our state labs to enter one positive test into three different systems just so that it could show up on that beautiful dashboard that all of you all would look at and wanted the case numbers at. The amount of infrastructure that we do not have, the basic, most fundamental IT data infrastructure to make systems work for patients does not exist. Um, and that became incredibly challenging. And the public health workforce, I mean, they were working seven days a week, 12, 18 hours a day, and it was really like their mission to serve the people of Alaska that was the duct tape that held our system together during this pandemic but they're tired and they're exhausted and many of them are leaving and going on to other things. We don't have that going into our next challenges. And so I, don't, I think if we don't find a better way to connect healthcare and public health, if we don't invest in public health, I think that we're less prepared in some ways now for another challenge than we were even prior to this, even though there's so many lessons learned. And so I think it's a real call to action for us to say, yeah, how do we keep our businesses open? How do we keep each other healthy? And that takes priorities. 
And then the third thing is perspective. Um, I struggled a lot with what's the best policy? What's the number one thing that's gonna keep us healthy and well? Is it this or is it that? And it became clear early on that when we worked together, we were more effective than any single policy. I, I learned a lot from many Alaska Native stories and tribes. You talked about the 1918 pandemic and how that just decimated so many of our communities uh, and villages. And through that partnership, like we don't have a known case where like the seafood industry ended up having a case that then moved into the local community versus the 1918 pandemic that completely wiped out whole villages and towns. And I think that that ability to say, what is the perspective of the past? What is the danger and risk of these infections? And how can we work together? Uh, really changed the way that I think our state responded um, and finding that common ground between each other. And I think as we think forward to what makes us healthy and well, I hope that we don't get sidetracked by widgets or policies or this one thing is gonna save the world. I think it's gonna take all of us. And I think being clear about what our mission and goal is and being clear about the hope to make us as healthy and well as possible, we'll be able to align and be able to do so much more like we did during the pandemic. So what is it that other states can learn from Alaska? Well, as you learned last night at dinner, Alaska's the best. So uh, um, <laughs> we should talk about that uh, yesterday. Um, you know, I think that, again, I think it's that those partnerships in Alaska, you know, we joke that we're all like just in a different chair at different times and we all kind of yeah. rotate through. Um, it is really building in those partnerships early on. Um, and so it's really hard to form partnerships when you're in the middle of something. When you're both sending testing supplies, it's hard to figure out exactly what that looks like. But like our vaccine team for COVID, we built in our tribes at every single level. So payment, distribution, communication. And so when we build in that structure to have different voices from different people, I think we collectively are able to do much more. So I, I think that that's the biggest takeaway that I took from uh, what we've done well. Uh, and, I, and I think many states have taken that lesson and are trying to apply it in different ways. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. Alaska has had, I, I will say, an outside, outsized role in national uh, policy and leadership. You're uh, the president of the uh, Association of State Territorial Health Officers, ASTO, which is, uh, you know, a, a fantastic, it is the most pre prestigious healthcare organization that I am aware of um, in terms of public health. And uh, there you are, the president of that. So you have a national perspective as well as a state perspective. So and from that, how do you see Alaska as distinctive not just in the COVID, but in the whole healthcare, public health space. Yeah, I think that the distances and challenges in our state help to show the gaps and weaknesses, but also yeah. help to show the strengths. And so yeah. I oftentimes feel like Alaska can lead the country in how to make a system that is more healthy, more robust, and move mm -hmm. more towards prevention. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be in this role. It's fascinating uh, to see how different states are organized, uh, the different responses. You know, we represent all the states and territories. Uh, and this, this effort uh, started last, last week, actually, as the, as the president, and we'll see how it goes for the next year. But my real hope is that we can better braid together public health and health care. I think really with the development of Medicaid and Medicare, those were really interesting and important ways to pay for the most vulnerable health care. But I think that those were then two trains that took two separate paths and public health started to go one direction and Medicaid, Medicare and public health started to take a different direction. And I think we're starting to see just increasing gaps and chasms where people are falling between those systems. So my hope in that role is how we can braid public health and healthcare back together again in the ways that we share information and data, how we can you know, really empower individuals to have their health in their hands. You know, I can have on my phone how much money is in my bank account and I can go to another country and I can get money out and it can do a translation. That's a secure, important information that I want to have secure. But I can't even see what labs are done in my state lab, you know, at my hospital, vice versa. My nurses in the ER enter eight different elements on COVID. I can see two of them at the state. One translates to the CDC. Those all take additional works. I think we have models of how we can do things safely and securely, and I think there's risk if we don't do it. I think we also need to build payment systems to pay for both public health and healthcare. Um, you know, in the 1980s, we said it's not okay that you show up in an emergency department with an untreated medical emergency and not be stabilized. I think we now need to say it's not okay to get CMS dollars if you don't do basic public health measures that keep us all healthy and safe. Um, and I think that's a federal change, um, and I hope that we as a country can get to that place. 
And then my third major focus is mental health. I think that we've really seen the impact. Uh, we saw this prior to the pandemic. We saw how deaths of despair, suicide, overdose, alcoholism have started to decrease the life expectancy in the US as a whole prior to the pandemic, and those have accelerated over time. And I think if we do not find better ways to create connection and address mental health, we will continue to see this increasing chasm in our society. Everything from boarding patients in the emergency department for sometimes months at a time in this country uh, to the ways that we're able to get people help, the connections that happen in school. So I'm uh, hoping to, to make progress on that front. So uh, ASTO presidents tend to have a specific, maybe one agenda item or goal, objective. So, or maybe two or three, it, were the three that you just described the ones that you would say, or th are there other things you would do as ASTO president? No, those are my goals as ASTO president, to yeah. better braid healthcare and public health, yeah. primarily through data, payment, and the way that we dress uh, yeah. uh, mental health. Yeah, and so when you bring that down to Alaska, what does that mean? Oh, I mean, so many things. <laughs> you know, I think that there, I think it's, it's really, one of the things that I love about working in Alaska is, again, um, working a shift in the emergency department to working with CMS federally or the White House or CDC. You know, it's really fascinating to watch these conversations move in different directions. I think that we need to overall look at the way that we pay for healthcare, as mentioned. I think that we need to pay for basic public health measures. I think that key data elements need to be standardized and required to be able to share information between them. I also think that we need to look at the ways that, particularly Medicare and Medicaid are done, the, the process of these 1115 waivers. In this state, we talk about, quote, the 1115 waiver, because we've had one. Um, but theoretically, we could have lots of 1115 waivers, and most other states have had multiple other 1115 waivers uh, to be able to change the way that they pay for care. But there has been this great learning environment across the nation on what's working and what's not. Um, and so the hope is that CMS will be able to take some of those key learning parts and make those into either a super waiver or be able to say these are ones that we think are are good for the country as a whole if you choose to accept them. You know, for an example, the ex extending Medicaid coverage for postpartum, that came out as like, here, we will approve this if you of a state want to choose it. And so if a, instead of a state having to go to CMS and do all the work to prove that this would be a good idea, even if it was proved in another state, it made it much easier. So I think that we could really reduce the lift for states to be able to think about the way that we pay for healthcare and move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that we as a state really um, have an opportunity to engage in this federal process right now to think about the ways that healthcare is paid for, um, and that will hopefully help us move upstream. And then really thinking about, again, those data elements. Um, you know, Carrie Pycoach, we brought up here, she's our data health person, she'll be presenting later today, you know, working with the HIE, working with the Mental Health Trust, working with people across the state, thinking about how we, how we um, make the system work for people instead of people just working for systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that happened in, uh, during the pandemic was what I would call maybe an erosion of public trust in, in public health. Public health has always been one, uh, one of the areas held in highest esteem. And yet over the last couple of years, in many parts of the country, um, public health has really taken a hit. I, I, I noticed the Kaiser Family Foundation just won uh, the highest award in healthcare journalism, the Loeb Award, last week for its reporting on how local public health officials bore so much abuse, in some cases, you know, threats on their life and so on through that period of time. So how does public health address that trust issue? Uh, that seems really important for the future of public health. I do think it's really important. You know, I think first I want to recognize, you know, really for my public health colleagues in the room, how traumatic this has been and how hard this has been. Mm -hmm. You know, I know very few public health officers who were public in their role that did not regularly receive death threats, mm -hmm. that didn't have to travel with security guard. Um, and I think we should all be able to do our jobs, be it in the emergency department, be it in public health, be it in state government, without threats to our life. We should be able to have a space in our common conversation where there's room to disagree and room to agree and room to be able to have those conversations. Um, and I'm just, in I mean, the team at the state and the local health department, I mean, they are the most selfless, hardworking, dedicated people you could ever have the honor to work with. Not just the COVID team, but the whole team, and has been an honor of a lifetime to work with them. Mm -hmm. When I think about how to build trust, you know, I'm a pretty concrete person. I like to-do lists. Uh, I like points and bullets. Um, I, I think that trust isn't this ethereal thing out there. 
trust to me is made up of two different things, and that is accountability and that's communication. And so when I want to think about how can we rebuild the trust in public health, I think about how can we rebuild accountability and how can we rebuild communication. And I think that there's really tangible things that we can do on both of those parts. I mentioned data and data elements. I think that that was our big failure as a public health specialty. We did not have the tools to give people useful information when they needed it, and that made people mistrust public health, understandably. What do you think this is gonna look like? What's gonna happen in this time? How many cases do I have? You know, I know my friend's positive, but you don't have any on your dashboard. How can I trust your dashboard? That doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, the vaccine works to prevent it? Wait, but my friend just got a breakthrough case. I don't understand why that looks that way. I think all of those led to a breakdown in some accountability and then the way that we communicated it. So I think when we think about how do we rebuild trust, I think that to build accountability, we need better data systems and we need to invest mm -hmm. in public health. The Center for Forecasting and Analytics that has come out of the White House is really thinking about highly contagious infectious diseases like we think about weather. I would love to have an app on my phone where I could look at the respiratory infection rate in my community before I go there. And that might make me make a different decision if I'm going to eat out at dinner, or if I'm going to wear a mask to that conference, or what I'm going to do. And I, as a public health official, kind of know how to put those pieces of data together to estimate it, but the average public doesn't. But we use our weather app all the time. We know it's not perfect, but we use it to be able to say, I need to bring a rain jacket there, or man, it looks like it's going to be really hot. I'm not going to be using rain chromes. And then we can make individual decisions. Everybody wants to see the me within the we of data. And I think public health, we very much focused on the we of data. Look, this is what the country looks like. And you're like an Utviadvik being like, that doesn't matter to me. Like, that has nothing to do with me. How are you speaking to me? And so I think we really need to make sure our data systems are able to speak to the me so people can make individual risk benefit decisions for themselves. And I think that that adds to communication. In healthcare, we moved to shared decision making with patients 20, 30 years ago. What's the CT look? What are we gonna do about your chest pain? This is what I know as a healthcare provider. This is what you prioritize as a patient and how do we move together? And I think public health has struggled with that. I think instead of saying these black and white, we need to move our language to shared decision making. This is what we know about these diseases. This is what we know about the risk benefit. So how are you going to make those decisions? I think a real learning moment for me during that was during the pandemic and the Delta wave was uh, hard and long and awful here in this, in this state. We had a really bad Delta wave and working in the hospitals and seeing that and the hospital association and the hospitals really standing up to that space. And we really struggled. I mean, people knew about COVID. They didn't trust public health. Like, how do we, how do we make it better? How do we have less lives uh, um, lost in this process? And I think many of you remember when like your phone went off, when the governor sent off that emergency announcement uh, at that time. And suddenly, like really, it's like the most beautiful epi curve, like nine to 11 days afterwards, our cases peaked and then they just plummeted afterwards. It was our single clearest intervention. And that wasn't telling anyone how to act. That was providing awareness of what was happening. And then a lot of Alaskans made individual decisions that collectively brought the cases down. And so I think thinking about the ways that we have accurate, timely information and are accountable to that, and that we communicate it, particularly in a risk um, shared decision making process, will help us rebuild trust. Yeah, that, that really does sound like uh, one of the key lessons that maybe could be shared with other states or that other states could learn from in terms of how to address this in the future, for sure. Yeah, and every state's different, um, but our phones definitely went off that one time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you think about, you know, kind of the future of public health here in this state and so on, I mean, what is it that you'd really like to share with this audience in terms of going forward? Uh, you know, what are the key public health messages that we want to know about? Yeah, and you know, I love my public health colleagues, but I also see my role as public health, but also healthcare, and seeing both of those roles. And you know, there's been a change within the department. So um, my predecessor, Dr. Butler, you know, he was the director of public health, and he was also the chief medical officer, but really sat within public health. But you know, he also was uh, president of ASTO, was he not? He was also president of ASTO. Uh, yeah. Yep. And now he works at the CDC. Yeah. yeah. And uh, has more one-liners than anyone. He's got he's got the best um, in that space. He's fantastic. Um, but we decided to change the way that the department was set up a little bit. So my role now sits in the commissioner's office, um, and Heidi Hedberg is the director of public health. So we kind of separated those two a little bit, partially to better, again, align public health and health care across the sector, make sure public health was doing its work, but be able to align across those ways. 
And I think with the split with the Department of Health, um, I think that that's going to also give us more space and ability to think about how we move upstream, how we move to be able to pay better for health and wellness, uh, rather than just kind of putting out fires. When I think about what I hope that we take from uh, this and, and what we can all do, you know, first of all, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just thank each and every person in this room. It's been hard and it's been long. Um, and I think reflecting on what that has been like is, is really important. We were, again, at dinner last night and Fern had a couple questions, but then we quickly overruled him and uh, <laughs> just ended up sharing kind of war stories about- It was, it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what this yeah. past year looked like. Um, and I think making sure that we all take time in some ways mm. to process what the last couple years has been like, mm. uh, because I think it's been hard and long for all of us. Mm. Second, you know, I talked about the, what we've learned with partnerships and perspectives. And I would challenge everyone in this room to know what the Healthy Alaskans plan looks like. Every state has a health initiative of what is, and how we can make ourselves more healthy and well. I used to row a crew in college. It does not work so well if you don't row all together, I will tell you. In fact, you can be thrown out of the boat if you catch a crab. Um, and sometimes I feel like in healthcare or in these conversations, we're all rowing in a slightly different way. And everyone's got their, 80th percentile, or they're this thing, or they're that thing that they're really focused on. And I wish as a state that we would be able to pull our oars more in the same direction to be able to move quicker and faster to a more healthy place. And so I think the Healthy Alaskans 2030 is the place to do that. That's where we as a community have sat down and said, what are our goals? Um, and so every, every presentation I do, I challenge people to take a look at those, to know what they are and find one or two that is like, that's my space. Like, that's me and I know me in that space. And that's something I'm going to move forward. And then the other thing I really just encourage us all to do is um, to care for ourselves. I, I, again, this has been hard and this is long. We had a big focus on Healthy Alaskans uh, 2030, but then last year we did you know, Healthy You in 2022. And it was our physical health, it was our mental health. Um, we just entered the final quarter and this was about goal setting and priorities and what we think about this next year. But the way that we individually lead our lives, just like the way that we individually mitigated COVID or we individually made the decision to get vaccinated, are ways that we can be able to move forward. So making sure that you're taking care of your physical health, your mental health, um, getting vaccinated because it's the simplest tool that we can do. I'm gonna have to put a plug in there. Flu is coming, it could be a bad flu this season. I mean, we were just looking at our hospital data. Our hospitals are actually have been more full this past month than they were even during Delta. And it's for all sorts of reasons and flu hasn't even hit yet. Like it is gonna be critical for all of us to stay as healthy and well as possible, you know, winterize and immunize and be able to think about what our community looks like. So, you know, we think about this in terms of weather and we've somehow taken public health and put it in its own box and then we've subdivided COVID into its own like separate, separate box and like threw it in the basement. The reality is, is these are tools that we do on a regular basis to be able to keep ourselves healthy and well and I hope that we can do that this winter uh, moving forward so that we're not overwhelming the hospitals, that we have our very limited workforce being able to show up healthy and work um, and that we're able to really collectively row that boat towards a healthier future. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, we um, actually have a couple minutes. Would you be open for a question from the audience or so? So if somebody has a, uh, has a question, April, do, you, do we have a microphone someplace? We do. So raise your hand if you have a question. We have a question right over here, Patrick. So. Um, First of all, thank you. Great, great conversation. Um, my question for you is in regards to what you just touched on, which is the upcoming flu season and the availability of flu vaccine. Um, I'm from Sunshine Community Health Center, and we had just put in our normal request for vaccines and got maybe 10% of our normal volume. And that really concerns me because I agree, I think this particular season could be extra bad. Um, how do we work together to overcome that kind of a barrier? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I think that we've, we've all seen in other areas where workforce and supply constraints have continued to hinder all aspects of society and the vaccine um, manufacturers and distribution are no different. So currently we are seeing some distribution limitations uh, in numerous vaccines, including flu, but are anticipating a lot more coming in in the very near future. 
So I think having really good two-way communication, working with a vaccine team to be like, hey, I need more, <laughs> like, where's that at? It helps us to be able to advocate on a federal level to say, like, this is what we need, this is where we get, and to be able to provide you the information so that you know, like, okay, I'm expecting 80% more next Tuesday, so I'm going to be able to set something up. There was an interesting study from Harvard that really looked at what are the key ways that we can increase vaccine rates this fall, and the biggest single thing was just access. And so being able to have access at FQHCs like Sunshine Clinic, having access at workplaces, having access at clinics, having access at fairs. And so I think all of us can do something to be able to increase access overall, but it's hard if you don't have the vaccine. So we need to make sure you've got the vaccine, but if we can all think about how we can increase access, there's some estimates that we could increase both COVID booster and flu vaccine rates by 30% just by doing access. Yeah. Great question. Someone else have a question? Over here. Thank you. Um, you touched on this, but the trust issue seems so important, and an uncertainty may have been part of that, our ability to communicate uncertainty. Uh, the, clear up to the CDC, it's a tough thing for an individual to hear a recommendation and not hear the uncertainty. But any thoughts on lessons learned there? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and so many, in so many regards. Um, you know, there were times during the pandemic where I said if I could have one wish, it was that people understood denominators. Um, I sometimes feel like just having uh, basic science and math education is critically important to a society that understands uncertainty as a whole, as well as some of the data and science as a component. So I think from the very basic fundamental, math and science education is key. Second of all, I think that we need to be better about explaining things in terms of certainty and uncertainty. Uh, it's, I don't think it's okay to say, you know, I even struggle with like, this vaccine will prevent, you know, prevent COVID. Well, it will decrease your chance of COVID, and for some people it will prevent COVID, but it's not black or white. I think one lesson for me during this pandemic was just how dichotomous the human mind is. It's just so much easier to think in black and white. I do this, then this, I do that, then that. But the reality is life is a series of grays. So how do we communicate that in a series of ways? You know, I, I see all the time, well, this isn't a vaccine because vaccine prevents disease. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not true at all. Um, and that's not the case with really any other vaccine. They all have different efficacies. And I think something that we've oftentimes left out of the conversation is not only the tools, but then also the risk. So as a mountaineering guide, you know, I used to instruct about risk and talk about what risk looked like. And if you were crossing a snow bridge, you know, you would talk about the probability of that that happening times the consequence of if it collapsed, right? Like if it's really small and it's just a small step, it's not that big of a deal. And I think that we need to be able to talk better in terms of public health terms and both the consequence of something happen as well as the risk of happening. So if we have tons of COVID circulating, we're gonna see more breakthrough cases. We're gonna have more risk just because it's simply there. So it's not just about the vaccine efficacy, but it's also about the risk with that circulating disease. And that's what we see with measles and mumps. Like if we don't have a lot of disease circulating, you know, it looks like the vaccine's working super well, but it's not really being tested in the same sort of way. I mean, polio is another great example. And then we need to talk about the consequence if you don't do it. And I think that that's what's really changed. You know, getting COVID today is really different than getting COVID in 2020 uh, because the risk of it is very different. Hospitals know how to treat it much better. We've got treatment options. Many of us, by far the vast majority of us, have either been vaccinated or had COVID. If not just once, I've had patients who've had it now four times. Uh, they've had numerous opportunities to have some degree of protection. So it's a, it's a hard one. I think it's complex, but I think it starts at basic science education. It, it goes through communication. And I think that that's a place that I've really struggled with um, through this pandemic. You know, our epi team would say, and I don't know if any of them are here, but I love them, but they'd be like, you can't, like, let me tell you all of the different things that, wh why this may or may not work. Let me tell you all the exceptions. It, you know, and I would try to share this, and, and maybe this is oversharing, but you know, I became known as within the leadership team is yes, but, because I'd be like, yeah, that might work, but, but this might happen, but that might happen, because I was trying to explain all of the uncertainties. But it's really hard to make policy on uncertainties, and it's really hard to make action on uncertainties. And so that was a real struggle. It was um, to how to explain those uncertainties, but yet not let those uncertainties paralyze us in ability to make action, particularly early on in the pandemic. 
you know, we would say like, we've got to make a decision about this with or without you, like with or without the data. And that I think is one of my biggest regrets with the way that the pandemic really played out. And I think this is true in every state. Policymakers were left to make decisions without the data and science people behind them because they were so stuck in the uncertainties because there was so much uncertainty and policymakers had to move so fast. And so I think we need to help to make it so our science and data people can move faster and in real time to give information and we need to do better as communicators and as policymakers to express the uncertainty to be able to close that gap. Yeah. I think I hear you saying the pandemic may not be over. <laughs> Well, COVID's still here. Uh, a pandemic means worldwide. So despite any uh, leader of any specific country, we don't get the opportunity to declare over or not. I think when people say um, the pandemic is over, I think people often say, what I hear them saying is, what does this mean to me? I mean, I think for many Alaskans, they have lived their lives for years now without many thoughts of, of COVID. So to them, quote, the pandemic is over. I think those of us in the emergency department and the hospitals are still seeing patients on a very regular basis who come in sick, who are quite ill, and who are still dying. Uh, you know, we had two people die just in the last you know month that came reported that were less than 20. I mean, we're still seeing deaths on a on a fairly regular basis um, from this. It isn't having the large societal impacts that it happened initially at the beginning, but this is still a highly contagious virus. You know, we used to be nervous about the R naught of two, two and a half, one person spreading it to two, two and a half other people. This virus has changed to the point that one person can spread it now to somewhere between 11 to 15 other people in a short time. I mean, it's become just very efficient at transmitting from person to person. Yet, as I mentioned, many of us have protection in a way that we didn't have before. There are treatment options. And I think what's heartbreaking to me, and I think the hardest thing for me as a clinician, you know, I've come to the terms that bad things happen. Accidents happen, cancers happen, awful things happen to people. But what I think is the hardest has always been when systems fail patients and patients die because of system failures. Patients not knowing that they could get treatment options. Patients choosing to not get vaccinated because of misinformation. Uh, patients dying because they can't get access to basic life-saving life medication. So these are systems that we in this room control and we in this room can change. And people are dying because of those system failures and I think that's the hardest thing. I wish we had time to continue the conversation. We are out of time, but thank you so very, very much. The people of Alaska are so fortunate to have you in the position where you are today. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Appreciate it.